This episode is a prequel. It's a segment from my old daily show that turned into alienating the audience about Dune, about the scope of Dune, the economics of Dune, the influences on Dune. It is a very Dune-heavy episode. Enjoy! My guest today is Ben Brockschmidt. He is a recovering congressional staffer, an infrastructure policy expert, and the chairman emeritus for life of the Whiskey Caucus, which is a softball team in Washington, D.C. that we used to both be on that in retrospect was more of a drinking problem than a sport, but nonetheless a very good time. Ben, thank you for coming on the show. Andrew, thank you for having me. And, you know, it it really was a good time. I don't think it was a drinking problem. I think it was... uh, you know, it was one of the last times that, regardless of your party affiliation or your tribe, you could step away and uh, just coalesce with people around bottles of whiskey and mildly warm Miller Lite. You know what? That is true. And uh, I'm, I made a lot of good friends, you, you included, that I'm still uh, I'm still buddies with that live in D.C. or have scattered. And uh, that was a fairly bipartisan group as well. I, I was a blue dog Democrat at the time, or at least working for some. Uh, but there were Democrats, Republicans on it. We all got along, and we all drank a lot of whiskey and occasionally played softball. Except for me, I never actually threw a ball. No, no, we, we have a picture of you somewhere doing that. But I'll, I'll hold on to that one until we get the uh, international version. Nice. Of, uh, yeah, know, let me know. I, maybe I won a game. I, yeah, let me know if, I, if I've got an athletic career. But why I wanted to talk to you today, Ben is I wanted to talk to you about Dune, because I know that you are a very big Dune aficionado, and I thought we could kind of walk through some of the political parallels of the Dunescape, or the Duneverse, depending on how you want to phrase it. <laughs> well, you know, it, it does come down to phrasing. It, it, you know, it, it is kind of fascinating, because I, I've listened to your, uh, the guest you had on for Star Trek and Star Wars. Thank you. And, uh, you know, those, those, they had very good perspectives, but, you know, there, there really is, when you look at science fiction, a lot of different ways to approach it, and you know, the upside of those types of, uh, particularly those two shows, it's very visual. Uh, when you get to Dune in particular, you have six core books uh, written by Frank Herbert, uh, and then you have a series of books written by his son, Brian Herbert, and Kevin J. Anderson, and it, it dives in really, really deep. So, I mean, there's a lot of directions. There's, there's tremendous like world building. And I, so t- where, where I'm coming in, I read Dune. I read, I believe Children of Dune is the sequel. Mm-hmm. Okay. I read Dune and I read Children of Dune. I started reading the third book in the series, but uh, I, I did not finish it. So I've not read the whole canon. Uh, and in my defense, I think that Frank Herbert was a genius at world building. I think that he could get hung up on uh, describing social interaction. This is just me criticizing him from a literary standpoint, because the first two books I think were really fun. The third book would be like, uh, uh, could I have a glass of water? What did he mean by that? The Bene Gesserit <laughs> always thought what they said about water was, and, and it'll be like four and a half paragraphs describing this kind of mundane interaction, and I, I got I got lost on it. That said, though, from what I know, the actual world building of the series is fantastic. We're like a spoiler alert to anybody that that is unfamiliar with this. Uh, like a, a Leto, who's who's the son of uh, of the protagonist, of the first two, uh, ends up becoming like kind of a god king, and it like it survives for three thousand years as emperor of the universe. Like there's there's some uh, some crazy stuff in there. There, there, there's a lot of crazy stuff, and, and you're right. He's he's Tolkien-esque in that he can go into a lot of detail. It kind of reminds me of the scene from Airplane. You know, oh, John never has black coffee at home. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he never does this at home. Uh, yeah. there, there's a lot of those things. But, there's a lot you know, of those it, things, yeah. So, uh, that, you know, where, where to begin then? I mean, there's there's so much here. I, I'm looking to you. you know, sure. You, oh, no, no. Two books. That's there's, a, there's you're, you're, you're not one. you're not going to just go on autopilot. You want me to lead the conversation? That's fine. I can do that. Oh. So well, let's let's kick it off by by talking about some of the parallels in it, um, because there are a lot of the parallels in it. I, I, I was kind of going through um, notes on Dune and, and going through some selected quotes and things in preparation for the interview. And some of the things that piqued my attention is I think. Chom, C H O A M, which in the mm-hmm. in the Dunescape or in the Dune, Duneverse, I should say, uh, is a it is the the transgalactic company which manages the spice trade, which I think is a pretty much direct parallel to OPEC, uh, down down to the fact that he's actually using an acronym in describing it. So there's that. Um, the it seems to me that because uh, he's writing this in what the 70s or maybe the 60s. Uh, I, I think the 70s and into the 80s. So okay. there's there, there's a lot that's going on right. uh, and a lot that he's seen prior to writing these that, that he picks up on. 
And, and I think, uh, well, so then, then being in the 60s and the 70s, I think that um, the fact that we're talking about a, a resource being harvested in a desert-like environment that is necessary for global or for, for galactic transport, there's a pretty, a pretty clear par parallel to me uh, between oil, again, going back to OPEC, this seems to have some kind of political social or uh, political economy elements to it. Uh, and then um, and then I think he gets into some really cool historical things where it's not necessarily a parallel with the world in which we live now, but but has been like uh, I think that um, uh, the, the emperor um, starting out uh, is almost this parallel to Philip the fourth of France. And this is where I'm getting really like into the wonky historical holes. So for those of you unfamiliar with French, I love it. keep going. Yeah. For, if you're not familiar with French monarchical history, uh, Philip the fourth, also known as Philip the fair and sometimes referred to as the Iron King. Uh, is the guy that locks up all the Templar uh, and then locks up a bunch of other people. He, he locks up a ton of people and takes their money. He does it with, like, the lepers, the Jews, the Templar, and several others. Uh, but he is kind of the—he um, he is sort of the last gasp of straight-up feudalism in French history because af after that, um, he, there's this sort of balance between the, the monarchy as a giant enterprise— versus all of the barons. And uh, previous, it had just been, you know, a bunch of warlords, and one of them was just called king, but you had, you know, a duke that's more important than the king at various times and that kind of thing. But he comes in and makes the monarchy this really strong institution. And in the world of Dune, you have the Landsrad, which is all of the all of the lords, you have the emperor, and then you have the spacing guild. And it forms this sort of, um, this sort of you know, balance, balance of power between all of these. And the spacing guild, I think, would approximately be like the Templar, uh, if they had, you know, oil money. So that's <laughs> well, my that's it, my it, connection it, it, to French history and Dune. Well, you know, you say French history, which which I admire. I was going to go more uh, British feudal history. Okay. Uh, because you do have the Great Convention uh, at one point in time. And by the way, if you're familiar with British, you know, feudalism uh, and the Magna Carta and all that stuff, you're going to be right here with us. Uh, so just hang in there. Uh, you're, you're, well, hold on. What did you convention. say? You're, you're, you're going to be what? You're going to be right there with us. Okay, so if you gotcha. understand, you know, just anything feudal. If you understand the lords and kind of the, the emperor, king, right. sitting on top with their authority, you know, you're going to be good. But they, they you do. You have the Landsrad, uh, which is all these great houses that uh, essentially control everything. You know, they have their individual planets, their individual areas. Mm -hmm. uh, you do have some lesser houses, but they're all part of uh, Joan. You're right. The, uh, the full name is the Combined Hunnet Ober Advancer American Palace. Hmm, okay. Uh, and I'm going to apologize Catchy. to all the other dudes. Yeah, well, you know, the, the acronym's so much easier. Yeah, you know, Chum sounds much better. And out like, Chum, Chum sounds I mean, like something not. terrible you'd call someone in high school. Yeah, it's like not quite Chum, not quite, you know, some other words. But yeah. you're, you're still along there. It's kind of like the Dune version of Frack, I think, yeah. is the best way you know, to approach it. Yeah. Uh, but you have all these great houses and some minor houses that all have a share in this. And you know, the most that we can figure out uh, of the Dune, you know, galaxy economy is that Shom controls all the economic affairs. Right. Uh, there is the Spacing Guild, and the Spacing Guild is basically a bunch of folks that have gotten incredibly high on this spice, this melange mm -hmm. uh, from the planet Arrakis uh, or Dune, uh, hence the, the series of the book, which really lets them see, you know, beyond time and space uh, and do instantaneous travel, which prior to that, you could have travel, uh, you could travel across the Imperium. Uh, but it took a long time. It was, you know, not quite faster than light. And, you know, when you get into Brian uh, Herbert and uh, Kevin uh, J. Anderson's books, uh, they talk about some of the problems that happen with that. You know, the occasional cargo ship gets lost in the sun or a black hole, sure. you know, the usual things. Well, and, and on top uh, of that, too, uh, like, like uh, it's Frank, Frank Herbert came up with, I think, a really interesting way of dealing with the faster than light problem that, that frequently happens in science fiction. So you have, say, like... Um, uh, oh, my, my mind went blank. Whoever wrote Ender's Game? Can you help me out there? Oh, Orson Scott Card. Oh, thank I was you. Thinking about that earlier. Yeah, yeah. Orson Scott Card. So in Orson Scott Card's universe, which I think is this kind of, uh, I, I enjoy his what he's done in a lot of his novels, where he just doesn't have faster than light um, speeds, so that if you want to go from one planet to another, by the time you get there, everyone in the universe is aged, you know, four hundred years or so, and so there's sort of instantaneous um, communication in terms of inter interplanetary communication, but the actual bodily transport means that if you're going to have a war, by the time you left, maybe the whole war has been settled. So it's this kind of weird cascading effect. It would be like if if we needed to get to the United Kingdom from uh, from America, and it took 50 to 60 years to do it, but we can communicate during that time. What Frank Herbert does is 
rather than going the Star Trek route or the Star Wars route, where um, basically there's just you know super, uh, faster than light speeds that allow you to traverse the galaxy very quickly, he has these kind of, um, I, I guess they're sort of like artificial wormholes that are controlled exclusively by the Spacing Guild and are fueled entirely by melange, by spice, which is, this, again, this sort of, uh, it's sort of like uh, oil plus peyote. A little bit of peyote, you know, maybe some uh, uh, back, bathtub uh, gin tossed in, yeah. you know, for a little bit of effect. Uh, but, but it, it, you know, that, that touches on a very interesting point. You mentioned Star Trek and Star Wars, and, and this, I think, is something that really differentiates uh, sci-fi for me. Uh, in that you have a lot of sci-fi where the focus is on spaceships and lasers and lightsabers and robots and all kinds of stuff. And when you get to the Dune universe, um, thinking machines, uh, computers, uh, mm -hmm. have been outlawed. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to something called the Butlerian Jihad, where the robots led by this robot Erasmus said, yeah, you know, we like doing experiments on you as humans. You're basically good as pets, uh, but we don't really like you, so we're going to try to wipe you out. Uh, and there's a big, you know, a big series of battles, and they eventually, uh, you know, send all the, the uh, get rid of all the robots, or so they think, until 10,000 years later. But you really do have this big distrust of technology. Yeah. So when you get to the Spacing Guild and the uh, Navigators, as they're called, uh, and, you know, they've been deformed by the spice, this melange, because it does have very medicinal properties. Uh, you do get some prescience. You can see a little bit in the future, which mm -hmm. some of our antagonists and protagonists are able to do. But then you also... You know, the more you get into it, uh, the more it shows. It's, it's the before and after pictures of mugshots, right? Uh, you know, here's somebody not on drugs. Here's somebody when they've done a heck of a lot of drugs. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're really deformed. They can't get around. But they can get you from one side of the universe to the other in a split second. I, so that's I, pretty cool, sh right? I shudder to think of what the Florida Man Twitter account would look like in the, the universe of Melange. Uh, where, where melange is replacing meth. That would be a, a horrifying, if that were the universe. That might, you know, for, those, for those that are looking for a fun science fiction premise, that might be it, is basically re redo Dune, except that Florida is one of the major powers there. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I enjoy that. And I, you, you make a good point with the technology as well, because it's an interesting position. As you point out, I think, um, I've, I've probably mentioned this on, on prior programs, but for me, uh, Star Wars and Star Trek are not in the same field, because Star Trek is science fiction. It's, 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 it, ultimately, they're both kind of exploring what humanity is, but Star Trek is doing it through uh, technology and by getting far enough away from our current day that we can kind of look back at it. Star Wars, on the other hand, basically is space wizards. You could call it space yeah. wizards if you wanted to. So I view Star Wars as a fantasy epic, um, and it just happens to be in space. Uh, Dune is kind of straddling the two because Dune is not, it, it does have elements of magic. I mean, granted, it's evolutionary-based magic, like the Bene Gesserit have um, kind of psychic powers, tele tele uh, telepathic powers. They're kind of like witches. Um, the uh, uh, Telaxi, I'm not sure how you say it, uh, but Delaxo, yeah, Delaxo. They're definitely again. I'll butcher all the I'll, I'll butcher all the uh, words here because when you read these books initially as a, a sixth grader, you get your you right. know, sounds in your head, and then if you go on YouTube, which I don't recommend doing, you'll find fifty different uh, you know pronunciations of these things and confuse yourself more. And so I'm going to get getting confused with these. I will get emails from all fifty of those people uh, emphatically emailing me with how I should have pronounced the things. So I, I welcome your feedback. Uh, science fiction geeks. I know that it's coming on this episode. That's great. Uh, the the Talaxu, um, I they're more in the in the like traditional sci-fi realm because they're they're dealing with technology. They're dealing. They're they're making face dancers. They're making um, eye implants for people that have had their their retinas knocked out by. I think they're called stone burners, but they're kind of this nuclear proxy. Um, so yep, they're 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 the nukes. And the thing with the nukes is after the robot war, there's there's the detente. Uh, on the nuclear weapons, where every, all, all the great powers in the lands rat, lands rat and the emperor uh, kind of go, okay, look, we can nuke each other, but we really have to hold on to these because, you know, some robot or some alien could come by, and we kind of want to preserve ourselves. Oh, really? Like, Wait, so not use these? So, so the re the reason that they don't nuke each other in Dune is because they they just want to hold on to it in case robots come back. It's not like a like a, a mutually assured destruction or anything. It's more of a preserve the nukes we have. Basically, huh. and it goes back to that great convention. And under the great convention, you really do have the uh, uh, the emperor, you know, who's supposed to be the middle ground between all these great houses. But you know, being an emperor and having his own uh, own attributes, such as jealousy uh, of the Atreides family, is the main family in these uh, in the core six books, and even a little beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they they said, look, we we every every house has their nukes. You have them there. 
but it, it's not too far off from where we are today where it's like, all right, we have them, but we don't want to push the button first. You know, we kind of want to hold off on that. Uh, but, you know, they, they tend to fight, and this is where you get into some of the technology. And I'd even say, you know, again, it comes to differences in sci-fi. I, I, I think a lot of us in the policy realm, how we got into policy, how we ended up, you know, on a softball field in D.C., uh, or even where you are today is, uh, you, you know, sci-fi to me is how are humans handling things in the future? How are we handling these different scenarios? So when you get into fighting in Dune, when you look at the battles that take place, uh, for the most part, it's, you know, you have small little shield generators in your body and knives uh, and some lasers. But even those have those limitations. So it's not uh, – it, it's a very different type of war despite uh, very evidently being in the future. Uh, they do reference that Earth, you know, essentially vanished. Uh, or was set aside as a nature preserve, depending on you know how deep down the lore you get. Wow. Uh, but it's it, it's a pretty basic technology you know centered area, and the Talaxo are kind of the exception uh, because they deal with genetic modification, as you said, you know eyeballs, and uh, they clone dead people. Uh, yeah, go- golas or ghoulas, I'm not sure how you say it, but it sounds kind of like golem or ghoul. It, it, it gets there. It gets there. And if you look at the, if you start to look at what Frank Herbert did and the language he used. He's got a lot of uh, Arabic in there. Uh, he's got a lot of uh, yeah. Jewish words. Mm-hmm. Uh, Landsrad, I think, comes Norwegian or uh, a Scandinavian type area. So he really pulls from a bunch of different places, which, again, if you make the mistake of going down the rabbit hole online, you'll see people saying, uh, well, it's been appropriated or, you know, this, this isn't right. Well, we're dealing with a, a universe where if you were to read all of the books, all of the expanded universe in the core six ones, you could easily cover 10,000 years. And I got a feeling over 10,000 years over a multitude of planets, humanity's going to spread out just a little bit uh, and mix and match and kind of do their thing. And, and, and that does, that also gets to some of the things of the Bene Gesserit, which Heden, I'm excited to tell you, uh, and everyone's here to hear it first. You and uh, uh, who's the one, who's the actress that you love, the one from uh, the Star Wars movies? Natalie Portman? Uh, yes, you and Natalie Portman, you will eventually have offspring. Okay, go Downside. on. How does this? I will Downside. eventually have offspring. Go ahead. Yeah, you you will have offspring. Uh, she will have offspring. Ten thousand years down the line, you your genes, your uh, your very important, crucial genes of your personality will yeah. meet with uh, her genes to create the uh, you know the perfect person. So the upset quitterach. Uh, yeah, the classic heterach. Uh, yeah. and, and again, I'm butchering that one, and I, I'm not going to apologize. Wait, hold on. I want to be clear on this then. Ben, are you implying that it's going to be 10,000 years before me or any of my descendants can possibly impregnate Natalie Portman or any of her descendants? Like, I, it's going to be eight generations before, wait, hold on, more like 400 generations before a single Heaton is ever able to go on a date with a Portman? Because that, that's what I'm getting from that. Well, well look, Lincoln, it's, 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 it's not, don't look at it that way. Look at it as the genes that have your fine appreciation of Scottish, uh, Scottish whiskey uh-huh. and uh, wit. Which is 20% of my genes. With, well, yeah, but we want like that 0.1% of the genes. It's really the cream of the crop there. Okay. And the 0.1% of, you know, her genes, uh, that, that's essentially what the Benny Gesserit do. You know, they've been doing this breeding program trying to find the perfect person over 10,000 you know, years. And, and is it is it like a is it a religious thing where they're just they're trying to induce the Messiah to show up, or do they believe that there is a functional element to this where this perfect person will become the the good emperor, or do they just enjoy tinkering? Well, uh, a good mix of both, okay. because you know this is a feudal society still. Right. Uh, you can't have they don't quite replace the Catholic Church, uh, and in fact, you know there there are references that they utilize the uh, orange uh, orange Catholic Bible at various uh, portions. Uh, Which, to to, uh, to pause you briefly, I would assume Orange Catholic Bible, because orange tends to be a reference to Protestantism. I I assume that that kind of means that there's some sort of fusion of Protestant and Catholic uh, theology in the future that's rebundled in a different canon. And I I would also imagine it being Frank Herbert, that there's probably a bunch of other religious influences within it. Oh, absolutely. And when you look at it, you you go through, they uh, they basically have what's called the Mission Ara uh, Protectiva. Uh, which whenever humanity started scattering among the stars, they basically went to all of their, the members of their order and said, uh, hey, when you get out there, uh, and we don't know when we'll connect with you next, we don't know when we'll talk, but can you spread this, uh, can you do some religious engineering? Can you tell people that there's a Messiah coming, here are the qualities, here's you know, what, what to look for? And you see that in action in the first Dune book where 
after a whole bunch of feudal betrayal uh, and the Atreides family, who uh, was previously in the ca planet Kaladin, which is a very water-filled world, mm -hmm. uh, they're told by the Emperor to go to Dune to manage the spice production, take it over from the Harkonnens. Uh, the Emperor is jealous of them. Uh, the Harkonnens hate them on, in a very Hatfield-McCoy-type way. Right. And, uh, you know, they, they end up uh, running off to the uh, desert, uh, Paul and his mom, Lady Jessica, and they meet these, uh, these people, the Freeman. And the Fremen have uh, their own version of a Bene Gesserit, their own reverend mother, who's kind of the, the, the most holy of religious figures in that order. And Jessica recognizes that, oh, this uh, protectiva is actually coming in handy. They know this stuff, and she mm -hmm. knows exactly what to say where their superstition or their religious beliefs basically open the door for her and Paul to walk in. So, so that mean, would that's kind, kind of be of like if, if – uh, if we put a, a colony on Mars and there's like a lone friar that goes there with them and just plants seeds of messianic comings in the future, just so that four or 500 years in the distance, if we need to use it, we can drop the right code words and, and kick in this religious imagery. Exactly. Uh, and I'll say, exactly. you, you, I mean, they've done this across the universe. And when you get into the expanded books or, or the later books, uh, you know, you, you've had humanity scatter even beyond mm -hmm. uh, the known emperor. Uh, and you end up with the Honored Mattress, uh, which is another all-female group uh, who was, you know, kind of the, the more evolved version of the Bene Gesserit, uh, who had 2,000 years to go off and spread. And they told them these same things, but, you know, the, the Honored Mattress ended up being more open to ideas. So they take all these Talaxo ideas, all these other ideas, and by the time they get back, you know, there's a lot of similarities between them and the Bene Gesserit. Uh, but the way that Frank Herbert set it up, it, you really see kind of the evolution of these ideas and the, okay, like that's your core belief. And then we see where you splintered and how you went off, uh, which, you know, I, I think is a lot of parallels if you look at the world, not just today, but over human history yeah. of those same types of ideas. Well, and actually, I want to I drill into some of his, his ideas for a minute, because it's, it's interesting to get into the mind of Frank Herbert um, when we get into this, this Duneverse. So to, Fr Frank Herbert, Herbert himself... Um, I, I imagine that people can uh, can find um, can probably find better political things than I have found on him. Um, I did not find like a a written exegesis of his political beliefs. I did find a few articles that referenced him as a, a Pacific Northwestern libertarian utopianist. You know, one of them, mm -hmm. one of those people that lives up in uh, in Portland, and they're very much utopian and into ecological communes, but they're libertarian. And I was like, oh yeah, right, that thing. Um, but he he did uh, he did have uh, political beliefs in his life. He um, he was uh, apparently cousins with uh, Joe McCarthy and referred to him as cousin Joe. Yeah. Although very he, very very distant cousin, and yeah. he was not very fond of Joe. Right. Well, uh, yeah, he was he, against the, 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 the blacklisting. Was a little, was yeah. A little much. Yeah. Yeah. Good for him. That uh, I I am in agreement with him there. If you're if you're curious as to whether or not I'm in favor of blacklisting people, I am not. Uh, and he. Uh, he was against the war in Vietnam. Uh, good for him there. So far, I'm with him all, all that time. And one, one of the things that I think is interesting, and I think this kind of tees up his political philosophy that we, we see, or at least his political sensibilities that we see throughout the series, is he, um, he was following the Watergate scandal, and he thought that it unwittingly taught the important lesson of not trusting the government. Uh, and so I, I don't know whether he thought it was a wonderful thing, but he definitely saw a silver lining in it. And he seems to me to be focused a lot of the time on the role of power in society and, and how that manifests. And I, I found a great quote, which I, I think probably is elucidating of, of what he thinks about the nature of power. But he wrote um, two things I'll read. He wrote, governments, if they endure, always tend increasingly towards aristocratic forms. No government in history has ever known to evade this pattern. And as the aristocracy develops, Governments tend more and more to act exclusively in the interest of the ruling class, whether that class be hereditary royalty, oligarchs of financial empires, or entrenched bureaucracy. And that's uh, from uh, Children of Dune, which sounds about right to yep. me. I mean, if, even if you go to, like, China, uh, you know, communist China, the uh, at one point, um, I, this is fascinating. I, this is, we already had covered French history, so why not get into some Chinese history, right? Um, Mao. There's international. There's a lot of yeah. other continents we can cover. We've, we've got two of the two of the five or six inhabited ones. Australia is questionable, but yeah, yeah we can cover them. Yeah, we can cover them. Um, so ch uh, when when Chairman Mao was doing his cultural revolution, so Chairman Mao, you know, he's the the he he's running the show. He's the communist dictator for a while, and then they kind of put him out to pasture, and he responds by leading this sort of internal bloody quasi French Revolution style revolt against his own government, um, and. Uh, Anybody that walked with him to 
get back to the Capitol that, that joined him in the march to, to throw out the people that replaced him. He made uh, generals in the army. Uh, and their children are are given like just straight up ar arist uh, aristocratic status today. So there is like an actual communist aristocracy in place, which in theory is supposed to be the one thing you don't get with communism. But you wind up getting it. You wind up getting noble families like uh, like the Castros. Uh, you wind up getting people who are wielding power through um, through capital within the within the framework of the state rather than through you know land and things like that. So I think he was somewhat prescient in that regard. Well, he, he was. And when you look at uh, what I would call kind of the two main protagonists in most of the books, uh, which is Paul Atreides, uh, who uh, – so the, when the Atreides family takes over Dune, uh, Leto Atreides is, is uh, Paul's father. He knows it's a trap. He knows the emperor and the lands rat have it out for him. Uh, Paul eventually is able to overthrow them, essentially by holding the emperor hostage uh, and telling him, hey, by the way uh, – I control the spice. Mm -hmm. And they say, no, you don't. And he goes, I know how to destroy it. So do I know how to destroy it? And they go, yes. He goes, yes. Okay. Right. Now that we know I have the power to destroy it, uh, here's how it's going to be. And at that point in time, you know, you have these Fremen who are, who are these people that have been living on Doom uh, in these uh, sieges is what they're called. Mm -hmm. I think in those little communities that, uh, you know, Doom being, being a very inhospitable planet, uh, the Fremen have learned how to uh, know how to bribe. Uh, people to mm -hmm. keep them away. Uh, they have their little homes, uh, primarily in rock outcroppings, and they've been hoarding water for decades. Uh, but given their environment, and this is where you know Herbert draws on some of his knowledge of the time uh, with the Fidekin and uh, other groups of the 70s and 80s, uh, you know they know how to fight. So when Paul comes and uh, you know his mom is able to say, "Hey, by the way, myself and my son are the promised ones." Uh, they go cool. Let's go on a <laughs> let's go on a jihad. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And uh, they they go off. They conquer the universe. And there is a, there is a, a moment in one of the later books uh, where Paul is sitting there with Stilger, his number two, and goes, "Hey, uh, you ever heard of Hitler or uh, Genghis Khan or like Stalin?" Uh, and again, Earth has been gone, and and Stilger is looking at him, going, "Why are you talking about these myths and legends? Like, what the heck's wrong with you?" And Paul goes. Yeah, they killed a couple million people each. Uh, how many people have we killed in our crusade? And Stilgar's like, uh, something like six billion, 62 billion. You know what? I lost count after a while. Yeah. And uh, Paul kind of looks around and goes, you know, the, the, the issue with Paul being the classic Hadarach is he can see the future. But when you see the future, uh, and this is an area where I think Frank Herbert does very good with kind of the wizardy stuff, by seeing the future, you're locked to that future. You can't deviate because consciously or subconsciously you make those actions. So Paul sees this reign of destruction, and he uh, he eventually walks away uh, after he gets his eyes blown out, yeah. uh, and uh, you know kind of wanders off in the desert. But then his son uh, Leto II, uh, who eventually becomes the God Emperor, he he merges himself with these sandworms, these sand trout uh, that in, inhabit Dune. He sees the same thing. He sees this, you know, okay, people are going to follow me blindingly. Uh, how do I use this to prepare humanity to, to fight the next threat? And, and as you look at Leto II in those, those last three books, the original six, Chapter House, and uh, uh, I just blanked on the other names, uh, you see him setting humanity up where he says, all right, during my reign, you can't go anywhere. Just stay on your planets. You're cool. And the second he dies, you have the great scattering where humanity just goes all over the place. Wait, uh, so yeah, so I, I get away from that. I, I, out of curiosity, yeah, a couple of things worth pointing out here. One, I, I think it's worth noting that yeah, that, that Paul uh, uh, Paul Atreides kills or his crusade kills something like sixty-two billion. I think that's the number I saw, uh, which is you know a lot because uh, we're up to what seven billion right now here on planet Earth. Um, so that's yeah, so it's just our planet nine times over. Yeah, it's a lot of people that <laughs> no are dying. Deal. What did, did Paul have a? Did he have a rationale as to why that was okay? Did did he? Because it, I read somewhere that he he thought the alternative was worse. I don't know what the alternative was. The alternative was just maintaining this, you know, kind of feudal balance structure, right? It was, and you know, when he takes power, he he takes uh, Emperor Shadon's uh, the Padish Emperor's uh, and Padish again, one of those words taken mm -hmm. from. Uh, okay, Iranian maybe? culture, which yeah, yeah uh, which which is a uh, you know leadership term that's been used. He marries his, uh, the emperor's daughter and tells her flat out like, "Hey, you're a political token. Yeah, for all purposes, you're the consort. You know, my wife Johnny over here, who's technically the consort, like she's going to have all my kids. You're just here because you're a political pawn. Right. Uh, which again, if you're familiar with British feudalism, this is all not too far off from you know the British history I I did. Mm -hmm. uh, but he does, he does see, you know, various futures, and, and he chooses one where he says, you know, all right, I'm going to walk away and set things in motion that hopefully make humanity better. 
uh, and prepare them because what uh, what he sees a little bit and what we get into more with Leto II and his son, who's the worm human hybrid, mm-hmm. is he sees that humans have gotten stagnant. They haven't they, they've gotten complacent essentially, which isn't good. Uh, which I think is something you know is is worth pointing out. Complacency is not always a good thing. Yeah, uh, I here on enough, uh, enough of a universe where you can kill sixty two billion. People I was about to say yeah. I'm like yeah, okay. Complacency is not necessarily good. I've I've got I've got you know a touch of Captain Kirk in me of of you know you you're getting too cozy. You need to go out and expand your goals. Uh, but but yeah, sixty two billion. I see. I in to, in my mind that that's making um, uh, Paul a kind of. Napoleonic figure or a tyrant, I should say, in, in the, the negative uh, in the negative sense. Um, and I, I bring up Napoleon because I think the kind of the classical definition of tyrant was a a very powerful person who was also doing things that impacted other people's lives based on whims that supported him. So, like in Napoleon's case, uh, Napoleon, when he was defeated uh, by the 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 first uh, was it the tripartite alliance or the the, the first time around mm-hmm. before he goes out to um, to Elba, um, he's defeated and he can. I mean, he can just retire. Uh, like, like there, there's at one point where um, they basically go, we're we're going to restore everything to how it was prior to um, you conquering, you know, most of Europe. Uh, and his response is basically like, no, I have to be on the throne of France, and and I, m- me personally being on the throne of France is worth the death of a quarter of all Frenchmen, uh, or whatever it is. And then that kind of uh, it it doesn't. I I will kill millions in pursuit of my ambition. Um, and while while Paul is not portrayed as this super ambitious character, I, I kind of I come down on that side of it where I'm like, ultimately, that's basically what he's doing, w- regardless of how nice he wants to be about it. He he is a tyrant who is, you know, uh, willing to sacrifice the lives of billions unless unless because, you know, the, the Dune, uh, Duneverse way better than I do, Ben, unless the robots coming back truly is an existential threat that required 4000 years worth of prep work, in which case maybe he was on the right. He he was, but you know, it, 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 Leto the second is able to see that more than Paul is. Paul kind of, you know, gets to a point where he he basically goes um, last Jedi, or I should say last Jedi goes Dune. Yeah. Uh, because after he gets his eyes blown out, he wanders off in the desert. His his wife has had twin kids uh, and dies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so his his uh, sister Alia, who's the definition of the devil, uh, you know, to, to touch on the Bene Gesserit a little bit more because you know we say that they don't like technology, but Again, the Talaxo play with genetic manipulation and the Bene Gesserit play with uh, genetic mutation. So when Jessica, Paul's mother, is pregnant with Alia, she does this basically drug overdose of the melange. Mm-hmm. And the resulting impact is that Alia ends up with all of the knowledge and all of the history and all the experiences of 10,000 years of Bene Gesserit breeding. So she basically is born knowing everything there is to be known. Uh, and ends up becoming this religious, you know, cult leader uh, in Paul's absence while his, his twin siblings, while his twin uh, children are growing up. Uh, and eventually it gets so bad for her that the uh, the voices of her, her evil uh, 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 uncle, the Baron Harkonnen, right. drive her to jump out of a building uh, after Paul gets back and says, hey, you know, wench, what are you doing with my my people? What are you doing here? But you're right. Uh, you know, Paul Paul does fall in that category, particularly if you, you know, using the Napoleonic thing. Uh, when Napoleon gets back from, you know, the island the first time, uh, he goes to Waterloo. And if you're familiar with that battle at all, he's not really engaged. He's putting a lot of trust in his generals just to go off and do what's right, which we don't see uh, or read a lot of the the jihad uh, in the Dune books. You know, some of the other books kind of touch in it in, in various details, but nothing that's like – nothing that I would say is in a, a Warhammer-type universe, if anyone's mm-hmm. familiar with that, where the world is chaos or the universe is chaos. And everyone's fighting all the time, but he basically is like, "Yeah, you killed 62 billion people. Like, that eh, probably wasn't a good thing." Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so this would be like Napoleon, N- Napoleon getting sent to. Th- this would be like Napoleon winning the war, going back to Paris, and then going, "You know what? I really bungled this one." And then like e- exiling himself to the Syrian desert, and then returning at some point to to uh, uh, overthrow or at least give. Um, give very stern talking to his sister who's running the empire. Did I get that analogy right? Yeah, along those lines, or if you go farther back, it, it gets to be late Roman Empire where you have, you know, the East and the West and you have the various generals that, and governors that have their areas. And, yeah, they kind of still have loyalty to the, the you know, emperor. Um, they've all gotten paid off, and some of the books touch on it that some of Paul's betrayers uh, later on in the series and even Leto's betrayers are ones who, you know, can trace their histories back and go, 
Yeah, I was part of all that. I don't really know what we were doing, so I'm kind of pissed about it. Uh, which, you know, you can't blame some of these people. You're, you've been in this desert planet, and all of a sudden you're thrown out into billions of, uh, you know, millions of galaxies or thousands of galaxies, or, you know, they never really go into that. But And yet he's just kind of still there, like, all right, we probably shouldn't have killed them. But <laughs> Which, uh, actually, I, 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 I want to go back uh, very quickly. One of the things that I enjoy about the series that I, that I think is worth pointing out is that um, – uh, it is rare in a series for the protagonist's mom and sister to be his sidekicks. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the time, like I, I love Robert Heinlein, um, but Robert Heinlein, mm -hmm. he really has like, he, he's very big on archetypical characters and he has like the sort of super happy, uh, sexually active woman who's just like, hey, like let's all have sex. And then he has like one other, and then he has like the girlfriend character. There's not really like a, um, there, there is like the femme fatale, but she's also sleeping with everybody. So there's always like this highly sexualized woman in, in Frank, uh, excuse me, in, uh, in uh, Heinlein novels, um, which I enjoy, but, but it is limited in terms of the characters. I think it's funny that with Frank Herbert, like Paul Atreides, his sidekick is his mom. Like you just don't see that in a lot of science fiction where like someone goes off to conquer the world with their mom. Uh, and then later on, his sister becomes this, you know, um, you know kind of sage witch character. Uh, that is in, in vastly powerful and, and apparently jumps out of a building. I hadn't got that far, but it's my fault. Uh, I had I had several years to do it. Uh, I want to. I want to say there's there's no spoiler alert there because uh, you know this this is uh, this, this is alienating the audience. You know portions of your show, but th there are a lot of you. You have the Betty Gisaret, you have the Honored Mattress, and then you have the the Fish Speakers, uh, which was an army under you know the God Emperor Leto Atreides, the, the Worm uh, Emperor. Mm -hmm. uh, composed entirely of women. So, I mean, he has a lot of strong women characters. Yeah. And the fact that the Bene Gesserit have been around for 10,000 years, and by other accounts, even beyond that, uh, to the time of Earth, because some of them know things like French, uh, mm -hmm. and can talk about clothes and other Earth-like things, which you get glimpses of, but they've obviously gone through their own evolution. Uh, I mean, he has a lot of strong women. And, and the relationship with his wife was very strong. Yeah. Uh, prior to her, to her death in the 80s of, uh, I believe it was cancer. Oh, okay, in, in real life. Okay, yeah. 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 Um, I want to go back for a moment because uh, there, there was another quote that I wanted to explore with him, uh, or explore with you um, from Frank Herbert that I, I think elucidates kind of where he's coming from politically. Um, there's a great quote. This is from Chapter House Dune, which would be what? the Not the prequels, but the like long, like this is within the Lido years? Yeah, part, part, of, part of what I would call the original six. Okay. Part of the original six. So he says in Chapter House Dune, um, all governments suffer a recurring problem. Power attracts pathological personalities. It is not that power corrupts, but that it is magnetic to the corruptible. Such people have a tendency to become drunk on violence, a condition to which they are quickly addicted. Uh, I, 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 am, I, I read that and I went, wow, that is a fantastic quote, and one that I, th I think I subscribe to. Um, I'm kind of, uh, you, you and I have had a lot of political conversations in the past, uh, but for, mm -hmm. for some reason, if somebody listening to the show only is coming in here on Dune and unfamiliar with my politics, possible, uh, I, um, I view power itself um, is a very, very suspect phenomenon. Um, and I, I, f I find it interesting to watch uh, a lot of the more partisan elements of the Republican Party and the Democratic F Party fight each other because the attitude is very frequently this one of power is good when we have it. Uh, the problem is not the size of the state. The problem is who's running the state. But if, if we've got a guy in power, then it's good that he's being robust in his use of executive orders, and it's good that he can evade the, the recalcitrant uh, obtruseness of Congress. We want that. Uh, and I look at it, and I, I look at power like Frodo's ring to bring in yet another <laughs> uh, fantasy and science fiction epic into this. I view power as Frodo's ring, where like I, I, I don't believe I or anybody else can really be trusted with that kind of power. Uh, and so I want to throw it into the volcano. And I feel like Frank Herbert has a very similar thing where it's yeah, power. It, it doesn't corrupt. It attracts the corruptible. There's an element to it of wanting to use it. And uh, and and that in and of itself lends itself to violence and force. Oh, it, it absolutely does. And it's up there with uh, one of my favorite political philosophers, the late great Douglas Adams. Mm. Uh, anybody mad enough to be president should never hold the office. Yeah. Or, or <laughs> I'm paraphrasing there. But I, I know you and some of your listeners know that one where. You know, they, they have, uh, you know, their president there who's like, wait, why are you president? You, you're, well, I'm the only one that didn't want it. Well, like, hold on. Oh, so okay. real quick, Ben, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to give like a quick, this is an ombudsman, ombudsman assessment of the program so far. I'll tell you what's happened. We probably cleaved about a quarter of the listeners, maybe a third of the listeners, about the time you talked about Leto becoming a hybrid worm king. 
that was the point at which we had a group of people that were they were willing to they didn't know what this was about they were willing to walk along up until we get into the three thousand year old worm king however there's also a group of people right now that i'm confident that are listening that have had this glorious nerdgasm when you said Dougley, we've been prepping it with uh uh you know with french history with a brief brief reference to the Byzantines or at least Roman emperors, and we've also mentioned Douglas Adams, uh, Orson Scott Card, and, and Robert Heinlein. And I think when you hit Douglas Adams, that was the, the moment at which the sort of uh, overlapping Venn diagram of hyper nerdness coalesced with classical liberalism in a way that probably made light shoot out of somebody's body. So we've made someone very happy today. I, I hope so. I hope so. And I'm trying to think what else I can cover to, to make sure we've we've really you well. Know, you know, what? I'll do a couple more on the nerd spectrum. Uh, I'll I'll do a couple more. I'm sure we'll 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 wander into a couple of other sci-fi flicks or something. But um, some of the other things that struck me is that there is an older, um, there's a very older uh, way of looking at the rise and fall of nations, which we don't subscribe to as much today. But our our founding fathers very much had this idea that. Um, there is a sort of natural lifespan to countries that they they come in in this sort of virile barbarian state, uh, and and this is also throughout uh, classical antiquity. This was the the dominant idea of the Roman Empire, uh, and um, and and through a, a lot of um, thinkers that you know kind of stretch from from the medieval era forward, where there's a virile barbarian state that's very strong and and very fresh, like um, you know like the the Mongolian horde that just comes out of nowhere. And they're, you know, they're sleeping on their horses and they're, you know, they'll, they'll be in the desert and they're hungry. So they'll, they'll poke their horse with a dagger, pour blood into a cup and drink it to keep going. Like this very gritty thing. And then it kind of peaks at this um, civilized but active state, uh, which for our founding fathers would basically be England circa 1740 or something like that. Uh, and then it, Give or take. it, yeah, and then it eventually comes down to the other side and it goes into opulence. And at that point, it becomes gouty and, um, in, in, their, in their mind, effeminate and weak. And, uh, and, and very frequently, like, it, you know, today we sort of have this idea of China as the sort of unstoppable um, monolithic culture of uh, hive mind, communism, and that kind of thing. But they, the, 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 the perception of how the Orient was uh, back in, in, you know, the 1600s, 1700s was that there were these opulent um, declining states you know the, the the ottoman empire with its its harem and its internal politics and it had sort of lost its um its grit uh and so there's definitely that theme that i see playing out in dune because you have the fremen who are these very very um you know uh violent slash uh, violent may not be the word they're, they're a very martial based uh, militant desert people that have been sculpted from a very harsh environment and are in no way um, softened by luxury, which was one of those, you know, kind of um, w w one of the big sort of anti-Spartan things that people were worried about. A lot of our founding fathers were worried about that. They were uh, some of the more protectionist elements that came into the discourse at the founding of our country was fear that if we if we allowed ourselves to have free enterprise with other countries and we would start importing silk and things and all of a sudden we'd lose wars. Uh, but I see that playing out in Dune because you have the the kind of corrupt, ailing, uh, decrepit emperor when Paul Atreides is coming in. You have these virile Fremen, and the Fremen eventually overtake it, and they, they fulfill this cycle of the barbarians coming in and coming to power. And then I assume at some point they probably eventually become corrupt and opulent themselves, and then, and then the great scattering happens. They, they, they basically do. You know, it, and, you know, you say, uh, you know, it's the barbarians, it, the empire, the, uh, when you look at the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, to, to bring in the rise and fall, so we, we've covered you know all the major literary works at this point in time. Yeah, people uh, people are about to get a master's that, degree listening to this episode, which is fantastic. You're you're all welcome. Uh, make sure to uh, write down those credits and don't take any loans out. This one's on the house. Yeah. Uh, but when you look at the you know the Roman Empire uh, in comparison to this, it's kind of the same kind of thing where you again have these various areas, and this is akin to you know some of the Goths and barbarians coming up to Rome and saying, hey, by the way, you have all this nice stuff. We want to fight for you. We want a little bit of this. We understand we got to, you know, do our dues. If we help you out, can you do some of these things? And with the Fremen, you do end up with some of that. And you do see, uh, particularly in those first three books, uh, you know, the in uh, Children of Dune, and uh, uh, I'm blanking on the, I had my notes up, but Dune anyway, Messiah, you, maybe. You I think it's Dune yeah, Messiah. Thank you, Dune Messiah, third? which is yeah. the one where Paul comes back from the desert without his eyes. Yeah. Um, but you see, you know, you see these Fremen who. You know they're they're strong in their legend and their history. The fact that they 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 say, hey, look, we got bounced from multiple planets. We wandered for a long time before we ended up here. 
Uh, and they see, you know, strength of the individual and strength of the tribe as something that's really, you know, intertwined. Hmm. Uh, because when you're on Dune, it's, it's a desert planet. Uh, water is not abundant. So they have these things called still suits, uh, which recirculate body moisture uh, and other liquids. Use your imagination uh, to be able to make sure they survive. And when you die or when you have uh, certain disabilities, really any disability, uh, you're killed and your water is given back to the tribe with the exception of um, – you know, they have these knives that are carved from these sandworms that, that have taken over the planet uh, through invasive species, essentially, which, which I'll cover in a second. Uh, but they're called these uh, Chris knives, which are made from the teeth of sandworms. And these knives stay intact as long as they're close to your body. And you're never supposed to draw one unless you intend on drawing blood. So if you draw one, congratulations, you got yourself a fight to death. Mm. So if you're ever drinking on Dune, Eden, and you've had a little too much spice wine, <laughs> Don't wave your knife around. It's not going to go well. And that's for all the listeners, too. Don't, yeah. Just don't do it. And that's Keep it good. in your pocket. Don't pull it out. That's good to know because I, I tend to get very oratorical when I'm drinking, and I tend to prove my points by waving a knife around. Uh, so I'll need to be careful. What were you going to say with the, the invasive species? Because that's another thing we haven't gone into yet. You know, we've talked a lot about the politics of it. We've talked some about the economy of it. we talked about these feudal parallels. Um, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't point out that ecology is probably one of the things he's driving at as well, given that there is a desert planet. Um, there are invasive species. There's, uh, there, there are environmental elements going on as well. So what's your take on that? Well, it, it's very systematic. And, you know, again, this is where I think the science fiction comes into play, because regardless of where you are, where you are in your political ideology, if you're even a little bit involved in politics and policy, you're doing it because you, you do have this view of, hey, tomorrow can be better than today, mm-hmm. which admittedly, depending on uh, if, if you follow state, local or federal politics, uh, can seem like a low bar sometimes. But you're there because you, you see the potential. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I say this as an Illinois resident who, you know, has, has gone through a 13-person Chicago mayoral election. So we've, trust me, we've we've seen everything there is is to have out there. Uh, but really, the inspiration—if you look at the inspiration of this, uh, these works—Frank uh, Herbert was was looking to do a story on on sand dunes at a beach, mm-hmm. uh, and started doing research and realized, you know, there's a whole lot more here. So for him, it's it's not just the ecology part of it; it's the fact that it's systematic, long-term, you know, examination and planning of things. Uh, which, again, I don't think is a, a liberal or conservative or, or progressive you know, point of view. It's, all right, what are we doing today that's not good five years from now, but is good 100 years from now and 10,000 years from now, hence the, the Bene Gesserit really being that, that big thing. Uh, but they do get into, you know, the reason that these sandworms are there is you have this trout that reacts to water, and it, it was brought there at some point in time. Uh, and in fact, over the series of the books, the, the book, uh, the planet Dune goes from, uh, Arrakis goes from a desert planet to a water planet to a desert planet to a blown up planet. Uh, and they're able Poor to Dune. take these sand. Uh, well, it, it really has gotten beat up a, a little bit. Uh, does does, does, know, that, does that not kill off all? Because the, the worms are producing the spice, right? Like that's one of the big discoveries in the second book or maybe the third book is that the, there is a there is a relationship between the sandworms and yeah. melange. So when it becomes a water planet, yeah, doesn't it just kill everything off? Chemical reactions. Oh, I'm sorry. So so when it becomes a water planet, doesn't it wipe out that species and you know ruin the galactic economy? I mean, think of it as as you would any species today whose habitat has been encroached on. You know, they they try to adapt, but water kills the worms very quickly. So they end up in a very small area of dune. Okay. Uh, and then there are various attempts to pull the worms, try to have the worms repopulate other planets, which they do succeed with Chapter House, uh, which is also the name of one of the later books. Uh, it ends up being the Bene Gesserit planet uh, during their fight with the uh, uh, the mattress, uh, the other mattress. Uh, but, you know, they, they have limited success. And eventually, when everything else has fallen apart and, you know, the robots are essentially coming back from the uh, great beyond, uh, they are able to escape with some of the worms. But, you know, you think about it, it's it, it's this commodity that's very, very abundant, very quickly traded by Chome and the Landsrat. And then you see over, and again, this is several thousand, this is like 10,000 years of time over just six books. And if you go to the expanded universe, it's probably, God, more than that. Uh, you, you really do see the rise and fall in these, you know, resources being used as, uh, you know, throwaway resources, essentially. Mm. Okay. So he very really much was about the, okay, what are we doing today, tomorrow? How are we, how are we approaching this as a systematic thing for, for Star Wars uh, fans? Uh, he, he would very much be on all the ramp. You know, how do you meld, how do you work with the planet as opposed to working against the planet, essentially? Okay. Wow. Um, a couple other things that I think we should touch base on. Um, there's definitely a, a role between religion and government 
um, or, or religion and power um, throughout the series, because generally, I mean, Paul Atreides is a kind of, um, he, he's borrowing several terms. There's the, was it the Quixot, Cataract? What was that term? Quasi Cataract, or okay. uh, again, I, I, I butcher it, but that's, sure. uh, but, but that, the, that's the ideas of it. That's the Bene Gesserit, Bene, Bene Gesserit term. But then when they're on Dune, he is identified as Muad'Dib, uh, who's this kind of, um, like, kind of a caliphate type character. I mean, it, it's, it seems to draw a parallel with um, the uprising that the British fought against in their Middle Eastern holdings in the, the 1800s uh, with the, um, I, forget, the, the, I think it's called the, the Mahdi. Uh, and and uh, Herbert has slightly changed it to, to Muad'Dib, but it's this, you know, kind of messianic political figure. And indeed, he becomes a, a towering political figure, um, which I think leads into a whole other issue, which is he seems to be very fixated on the idea of messianism, uh, both religiously and politically. He is. But, you know, it's interesting because you, you look at it and, and you know, Muad'Dib does come from uh, uh, the, the teacher, uh, or, or I think it's like uh, the teacher of literature, or, or something along that lines. Again, he, you know, to Herbert's credit, he does pull from a lot of areas, uh, which again, if you're looking at this long term, several thousand years in the future, makes sense. I would hope and assume uh, that when we eventually leave this planet uh, and scatter ourselves around the galaxy, uh, it, it's not just going to be okay. There's the Italian planet. There's the American planet. There's you know, the German planet. It's like all right, everybody pick a planet and just go there. And whoever gets there, like figure it out. Uh, but he he picks up the – Paul picks up the Messiah a little more hesitantly where he realizes, all right, got to do this to get back, uh, clear my family's name, uh, you know, get the – get back to the Harkonnens, take command of the empire and do these things. But then as he's there longer and longer, that's again where he has a conversation with Stoker going, so we we killed how many billions of people? 62? That's – yeah, that's that's a Tuesday for you. Yeah. Uh, but then by the time you get to his son, Leto, who, again, has merged with fish – uh, to, to get the other third off, who were who were hesitant but held with us on that one. Yeah. Uh, you know, you you see him doing much more looking in the future, and he, you know, his bottling up and and being the god, bottling humanity up and being the god emperor. Uh, he sees it as a way as yes, I am your god emperor. I am you know worship me, don't question me. But he inevitably sees his death uh, as being the reason for humanity to go beyond that. But you look at a lot of the other leaders uh, that pop up. You know, particularly going back to the start of the first book with uh, Duke Leto Atreides, uh, his MO is one of people follow him out of loyalty, out of respect, because they treat people well. Whereas you see the evolution of the family going to the, they follow me because they fear me and I'm a worm god. Mm. Uh, which That's, is that, is, that is inevitably area. what happens. Everybody, he, he, the dictator comes in to save us from the, uh, from the invading German hordes and pretty soon he's a worm god. Well, and then when he dies, all the worms fall off of him, and that's like the end of it. It's, it, it is one of the space wizardy you know, parts of it. But again, you know, he, he does stress the – in the Bene Gesserit and the uh, Honored Mattress are, are both examples of that, where you have the power structure so intertwined with this religious yeah. uh, theology. Although, uh, although it, the, 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 an issue. The, the Mintats don't have a planet, do they? Because we, we haven't mentioned the Mintats yet, and they're one of my favorite things in the Dune, Duneverse. Uh, Mintats, for, for the people that have decided to listen to about 54 minutes of this – uh, but <laughs> still aren't familiar with the landscape. Um, Mintats, going back to your very beginning comments, uh, Ben, when you, when you mentioned that there, there is this uh, kind of militant Luddite position of mankind in this world because they'd had an, an AI uprising and they had to put them down, they don't have AI and they don't have what they call thinking machines. And as a result, this, this class or this order, I, I don't even think it's an order, it's more of like a vocation of people have risen called Mintats who can do incredibly complex computations in their heads. So they're, they're sort of organic supercomputers that uh, drink juice and then as a result of that and through very intense training are able to be, you know, sublimely gifted mathematicians. They, uh, but they're not, they're never like a power though, are they? No, you know, you have the mentats and then you have the suck doctors. Um, it, it, and there's, you know, they're, they're really, the doctors uh, of the suck school are ones that uh, are deemed uh, infallible. You know, they're focused on their patients. They can't uh, commit treason. Uh, although that Except for that one time. Everything. Except for that one time where, you know, you end up with a long-term worm god. Uh, but then you have the Mentats who, you know, and if you dive into the expanded universe, uh, they, Brian, you know, J. Anderson, and, and, or uh, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson really do a good job on this one where the Mentat school comes from uh, working with the robots. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it comes from what? Have, it comes from collaborating essentially with the robots. Oh, really? Okay. Trying to you know show that they that humans can be taught to think like this. 
uh, but they're supposed to be very logical, very you know focused uh, individual uh, individuals, uh, which you know you it goes relatively well, uh, but you do see some of them. Uh, you know, you have the one for the Harkonnens who's just uh, a terrible individual, mm-hmm. uh, rapes, pillage, murders everybody. Uh, then you go to you know the uh, Atreides household, and it's very different. Uh, it's very you know more thought process, uh, you know, very, very much more honorable. Uh, but it does, you know, Frank Herbert does stress throughout these books, as, as do his son and Kevin J. Anderson, that even with those types of training, uh, you're still human, uh, which really goes back to some of the Bene Gesserit stuff of, you know, what is an animal? What is a human? Mm. You know, how do you approach these things? And ultimately, everyone is driven by something, uh, whatever that may be, may vary, but everyone has something, even if you are a thinking machine. That uh, you know, trying to be a thinking machine that can do all these computations and be very logical, you, you still have your passion, you still have your own desires, you still are an animal at your core. Yeah, which I think is a a, a very fair observation. Um, when they've done experiments, not experiments, I should say, when they've had people uh, here in, in the real universe, in which you you and I live, uh, um, when people have, I think it's damage to their um, their front right neofrontal cortex, or at least part of their neofrontal cortex. Um, that's that's responsible in part for emotion. Um, they, they've have these weird cases where actually f- forget forget the neurology I just said because I'm probably saying the wrong part of the brain. Basically, the part of the brain that is correlated with emotion when that's damaged, um, it's this weird phenomenon where someone will they'll have a coherent conversation with you. Um, they're very polite. Um, they're you know they're they're perfectly rational and coherent, but because they no longer have that emotional core, the drive to do things disappears because ultimately. We're not rational people. We're rationalizing. We we tend to make emotional decisions. Then after we make that decision, we we want to back it up to ourselves. So it sounds like we deliberated on it. We do occasionally, but for the most part, though, there's a heavy emotional impetus in what we do. And uh, were you to just remove that and be a, a completely logical phenomenon, then then you no longer have a drive to do anything. Uh, Vulcans, for example, are logical, but they're actually deeply emotional. For those that are that are Star Trek fans, they they are suppressing the emotion. They are sort of super ultra stoics, but they have not purged it except in very rare states. Uh, and uh, perhaps the Mintat are in a, a comparable capacity where that uh, human drive or whatever their particular motivations are, are still existent. They're just um, uh, multiplied in terms of the power and focus they have by their Mintat skills. Yeah, and, and it is one where, you know, you keep in mind in the Dune universe because the Mentats and others, they're, they're taking all kinds of drugs. Like if you like drugs, and again, this probably goes to the Northwest you know, part of the country type thing, a little bit of the libertarian, like, yeah, have a little spice, have a little tea, like, it's all fine, we're yeah. good here. Uh, you, you do end up with people that have extended lifespans. So, you know, you look at uh, some of these mentats and they end up living for just, you know, a, a very long time uh, in service of individual families. Uh, so they get to know, uh, you know, uh, Fifer Howitt, uh, who's the uh, mentat for the Atreides. Uh, he's seen Leto's father, he's seen Leto, he's seen Paul. Uh, he, he ends up you know, dying uh, mm-hmm. the first book, but he's there for a lot of it, uh, where you know he can pass that knowledge on and, and has that retained memory. Uh, very similar to the Benny Gesserit and, and and others, but how they approach things is very different. But you're right, it it, it you know it's it, so much of the books do focus on the the minds and how they how people end up approaching these things in different scenarios. Uh, but ultimately, you're still driven by something, even if you're looking at it going, you know what, maybe a jihad across the universe isn't the way to go. <laughs> well, and actually, before we leave, because we're going to take off here in a minute, uh, I want to exp- uh, I want to focus on the future for a moment, the future of Dune, uh, because I was talking to a friend recently who told me that they are planning, I, I-, I don't know which group's planning, but they're planning to remake Dune as a film. Have you heard this? I have, I have, and you know, I'm terrible with actors and actresses, uh, so they had the miniseries back in the early 2000s. Well, hold on. Let's, uh, let's go all the way back because they almost had, uh, the, like, the, the greatest question of what if in science fiction history from a cinematic perspective is Dune because there was a, was it a Bolivian director or a, a Paraguay director? He was going to put together Dune, and it had the weirdest cast. Salvador Dali was going to be the emperor. Yeah. Uh, Orson Welles was going to be Harkonnen. I can't remember the other people they had. In, they had um, H.R. Geiger lined up to do the visuals for it. Um, there was some famous play. Like, it was going to be this, and somehow it fell apart, which saddens me to no end because I would love to see Orson Welles 
as as Harkonnen. Uh, but that one fell fell through, and then they had the uh, the David Lynch movie of Dune, which I, I rather like. I like that one. I like the weird boxy force fields they've got, uh, and it's got Patrick Stewart in it. And you can't go wrong with Patrick. I was going to say it has it, it has your Eternal Man crush, yeah. Sir Patrick Stewart, oh, in there. It's a pleasure uh, to the, see my it, Duke again. Yeah, and the the Dunes of Arrakis. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. And then yeah, and then they did the miniseries that Sci Fi did, which I didn't think was very good. I didn't like that one. I, if you look at the if you look at it, you can tell that they're on a a Hollywood backdrop, and you can actually see the fabric of the painting behind them of that that dunescape flutter in the wind. And I, I'm just when I watch it, I'm hyper aware that I am looking at a Hollywood stage. So I'm excited about the forthcoming film. I hope they do cool things with it. Well, I, I hope so too. And uh, Jedorowski's Dune is a documentary. Um, oh, nice. Alejandro Jodorowsky's ambitious movie uh, that ultimately wasn't made. Uh, it, it's worth a watch. I don't know if it's on Netflix or Amazon or where it's at, but it, it definitely goes in the back back story of that. I will check uh, that out. Yeah, you know, I'm excited. Yeah, I, I'm excited about the you know the the Dune story, uh, the Dune movie next year because anything that opens up uh, sci-fi to new audiences, uh, and this is where I will fight with some of the Star Wars and Star Trek fans, uh, yourself included, who you know, look at the movies of the last 10 or 18 years and go, "Well, those are terrible." Well. You know, when you encounter sci-fi, you encounter it at a certain age, and it, it's going to have an impact no matter mm. you know, who you are. But if it's expanding people to, you know, these different scenarios and, and different uh, opportunities out there, I think it's a good thing. And you look at uh, – I did cheat. I did pull up the cast of the movie because, again, I don't know these things. Uh, Jason you yeah, never Momoa, do that. See, uh, what, 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 I, what I do, Ben, is I print out my notes in advance, and then I just glance at them like I'm doing them from the top of my head so that at least one or two listeners will think, that guy is really smart. And I am. But I am also looking at my notes occasionally. No, and I've known you long enough to know that that, that you cheat sometimes. Yeah, I'm I'm a trickster with with no short term memory. You're aware of that, yeah. But that's you know the, again. I think the movie anything that opens it up. Uh, I think the sci fi community in general, you know, should be more welcoming to people. And it's okay to disagree whether you're, you're a Whovian, uh, you know, whether you're a fantasy fan of, of Tolkien or whatever else. Like, again, it's about you know the future and you know what we as humanity can do. Uh, as opposed to, you know, okay, you're a Jar Jar Binks fan and, you know, mm. burn in hell, uh, which generally is frowned upon, although that might be one thing. I'd, I probably pulled the wrong example up, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. I, I think that there's something to that. Uh, that uh, I, I'm curious for when I have kids, with or without Natalie Portman, whether or not they will like the— 10,000 years later. Pre, yeah, 10,000 years later, whether they'll like the prequels. Cause I, and I like elements of the prequels. I'm not, I'm not anti-prequel. There, there are a lot of things I would have done differently. But I, like, I, I, wonder if, um, I wonder how much of that is me not liking the film versus me being in my late teens and 20s when I saw the film, as opposed to when I saw the original Star Wars. And I'm, when you're a kid, everything's better. When you're like you know, 10 years old, uh, you're, you're not a cynic yet. And, and so I, I think there's something to that. Um, Ben, I'm going to cap it off there. I have really enjoyed talking to you about Dune. Uh, I feel like we 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 should have bitten off a smaller portion of this because we probably could have done nine hours given the sheer scope of work. That said, though, we hit a lot of content over the course of this hour. Thank you for doing it with me. Absolutely. And, you know, when you've read the other three books, if you want me to come back and, and go back down the uh, sandworm hole, I'm happy to do that uh, and look forward to, you know, other people you have on talking about Heinlein and uh I, I am very envious of whoever you have on talking about Battlestar Galactica way down the line. Because uh, I'm, not that, gonna, uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but I, there's somebody that I'm looking into that I'm very excited about if I pull it off. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's but you what know what? I've also been excited to talk to you. Ben, thank you so much for coming on.